give him the fucking controller! A person on the Ocean Gate underwater vehicle spoke these words. After the underwater vehicle hit a sunken ship and couldn't be controlled for more than an hour, Sockton Rush and David Lockridge struggled for command of the vehicle because Rush didn't follow the safety rules. He landed really near, got caught in the moving water, found a way to fit the underwater vehicle under the falling front of the Andrea Doria ship and went into a state of extreme fear. Lockridge attempted to steer, but Rush had declined to allow him, having a breakdown for more than an hour until one of the passengers screamed, Give him the fucking controller! Right then, Rush angrily threw the controller, a joystick used for video games, toward Lockridge's head. Lockridge managed to release the sub within 15 minutes. In this video, we'll explore the frightening news story that Ocean Gate uncovered, and we'll also be giving out a Titanic poster, so stay tuned until the end of the video to learn how you could win. Back in, De back in December 2015, which was two years before they constructed the Titan sub, Rush lowered a scaled-down model of his 4,000-meter sub into a pressure chamber, and he watched it collapse under the pressure of 4,000 pounds per square inch. PSI, which is equivalent to about 2,740 meters deep underwater. The main purpose of the test was to confirm that the design of the pressure vessel could endure an external pressure of 6,000 psi, which corresponds to a depth of approximately 4,200 meters. At that point, he might have changed his approach, taken a step back, and rethought his decision, but he didn't. Instead, OceanGate released a statement to the media, declaring that the test had been a big success because it proved the advantages of using carbon fiber. Rush didn't even pause his actions. He rushed forward, crashing into his director of marine operations, David Lockridge. Lockridge had moved from Scotland to join OceanGate, selling his house in Glasgow, relocating to Washington State with his wife and seven year old daughter. Unlike many of his new co-workers, Lockridge was a seasoned expert in underwater activities, a pilot for submersibles and remote operated vehicles, a marine engineer, and an underwater inspector for the oil and gas sector. He had operated rescue submarines for the British Navy to save people trapped in sunken military submarines. By January 2018, the Titan submersible was nearly finished and about to start its testing in the ocean. But before that, Lockridge, who was responsible for ensuring the safety of the crew and clients during underwater and surface operations according to his contract needed to inspect the sub and approve it for diving. However, that wasn't going to occur. Lockridge had been closely observing the progress of the sub with growing concern. He had disagreed with Ocean Gate's engineering director, Tony Nissen. In response, Ocean Gate had denied Lockridge access to inspect the sub's oxygen system, computer systems, acrylic viewport, O-rings, and the crucial connections between its carbon fiber hull and titanium end caps. Combining materials with such significantly varying pressure tolerances was also discouraged, and Titan couldn't receive certification because it was constructed from the wrong materials and was built incorrectly. Once he had reached a decision, he was set on a course that couldn't be changed. Lockridge created a list of more than 25 issues that needed immediate attention. These included missing bolts and batteries that weren't properly secured, parts fastened to the outside of the sub using zip ties. The grooves for O-rings were machined inaccurately, which could lead to water getting in. Seals were not properly attached. The interior of the Titan contained a highly flammable material derived from petroleum. Hoses were tangled around the exterior of the sub, posing a risk of entanglement, especially in a location like the Titanic wreck, where various objects extend outward like spars, pipes, and wires. However, even these problems seemed minor compared to what Lockridge discovered on the hull. The carbon fiber material was visibly falling apart, full of gaps, separations, and holes that resembled Swiss cheese, and there was no way to repair this aside from discarding the hull entirely. The process of making carbon fiber fiber material is precise. Interwoven carbon fibers are wrapped around a cylinder and bonded with epoxy, then enclosed in cellophane and cured in an oven for a week. The aim is to achieve absolute consistency. Any errors become permanent during the curing process. Considering that the hull would experience immense pressures greater than any other carbon-hulled vehicle had undergone, there was a risk of potential fatigue between layers due to the cycling of pressure, Lockridge noted, especially if imperfections existed within the hull itself. 
They would need to use thermal imaging or ultrasound to inspect the hull and uncover its flaws. Lockridge insisted on non-destructive examination, with the results shared with him before any manned dives took place in the water. He firmly stood his ground on the necessity of scanning. This process would identify any areas of weakness and create a starting point for checking for signs of wear after each dive. Scanning the hull shouldn't present a problem, right? Lockridge pointed out in another document that OceanGate had previously agreed to perform a hull scan. Spoiler alert, the hull was never actually scanned. The OceanGate engineering team, as of March 2018, had no plans to conduct a hull scan. According to the company's lawyer, Thomas Gilman, they believed such a scan wasn't readily available and might not be particularly effective anyway. Instead, OceanGate intended to rely on acoustic monitoring, using sensors on the Titan's hull that would sound an alarm when the carbon fiber filaments produced audible sounds as they broke. Lockridge's report was direct and technical, clearly assembled by someone highly knowledgeable in the field, the type of document that, in most companies, would lead to a promotion. In response, Rush chose to immediately terminate Lockridge's employment, file a lawsuit against him and his wife, even though Carol Lockridge wasn't employed by OceanGate or in the submersible industry. The lawsuit was for alleged breach of contract, fraud, unjust enrichment, and misappropriation of trade secrets. Rush also used the threat of affecting their immigration immigration status and sought to have them cover OceanGate's legal expenses. Ironically, Lockridge had previously saved Rush from making a mistake, at least once. In June 2016, Rush operated OceanGate's shallow diving sub, the Cyclops 1, to reach the location of the Andrea Doria, a massive 700-foot ocean liner and a significant entanglement danger that sank in 1956 near Nantucket in an area of the Atlantic known for its thick fog and strong currents. The ship rests at a depth of 240 feet in cloudy water, entangled with discarded fishing lines. At this depth, the wreck can be reached by advanced scuba divers, but it's still quite hazardous, resulting in 18 deaths. Rush was going to capture sonar images of the shipwreck, accompanied by Lockridge and three clients. Lockridge, serving as the chief pilot and in charge of operational safety, had established a dive plan that included guidelines for approaching the wreck, given the entanglement risks. Precautions were necessary, like landing at least 50 meters away and surveying the site before getting closer. However, Rush ignored these safety instructions. He landed too close, got caught in the current, managed to wedge the sub beneath the Andrea Doria's decaying bow, and experienced a full-fledged panic. Lockridge attempted to assume control, but Rush refused to yield, experiencing a breakdown for more than an hour, until a client finally yelled, give him the free Freaking controller. At that moment, Rush threw the controller, which was a video game joystick, at Lockridge's head. Lockridge managed to free the sub within 15 minutes. Although the expedition was initially intended to involve 10 dives, it ended abruptly due to OceanGate citing unfavorable weather conditions. After returning to Boston, Rush held a press briefing. We had the chance to explore the Andrea Doria area for nearly four hours, which is over 10 times longer than scuba divers can, he announced. Ocean OceanGate's website indicated that the dive had focused on the front of the ship. Lors de la deuxième the plongée d'essai en profondeur du Titan au Bahamas en avril 2019, an endeavor to reach a depth of 4,000 meters, the sub began making alarming cracking and gunshot-like noises, forcing its descent to halt at 3,760 meters. Rush piloted the sub, accompanied by three passengers on this highly risky dive. One of them was Carl Stanley, a seasoned submersible pilot who later described the noises as the hull shouting at you. Stanley was accustomed to taking on considerable risks. He had constructed his own experimental uncertified sub and operated it in Honduras. However, he was so shaken by the experience that he sent multiple emails to Rush, strongly advising him to delay the Titan's upcoming commercial launch, which was less than two months away. Stanley suspected that the carbon fiber was deteriorating. He believed that there might be a defect near the flange that would worsen over time. The only question in his mind was whether the failure would be catastrophic or not. He recommended Rush to step back and conduct 50 unmanned test dives before allowing
allowing any other humans to enter the sub. In his characteristic manner, Rush disregarded the advice. Rush told Stanley that one piece of experiential data wasn't enough to determine the hull's integrity, and he instructed Stanley to keep his opinions to himself. However, this was all before Paul-Henri Nagalette's involvement with Ocean Gate, a prominent figure in deep sea exploration, whose expertise regarding the Titanic led to his unfortunate connection with Rush. Nagalette had an impressive background as a commander in the French Navy, serving as the captain of France's sixth submarine, the Nautil, and leading the country's deep submergence group. As the commanding officer of the French Navy's explosive ordnance disposal team, he cleared mines from the English Channel, the North Sea, and the Suez Canal. And that was just on the first page of his impressive resume. It wasn't as if Naglet's friends didn't attempt to dissuade him. Oh, we all tried, Leahy remarked. I really tried to convince him not to go out there. I seriously pleaded with him, saying, Don't go out there, man. But Nagalet was fully aware that what they were cautioning him about was accurate, and he still wanted to proceed. He even suggested, Maybe it's better if I'm out there, as Lahai remembers Nagalet saying. His intention was to prevent any foolish actions or potential harm to people. After the implosion incident, the French newspaper Le Figaro reported that Nagalet had confided in his family, expressing concern about the Titan's carbon fiber hull and its large viewport, seeing them as potential weak points. He felt a bit doubtful about this new technology, yet he was also intrigued by the opportunity to pilot something innovative. Mikol Lauer, a colleague of Nagalet and a marine archaeologist, explained to the paper that it was hard for him to envision a mission to the Titanic without participating in it himself. Now, reports are emerging about the series of issues during Ocean Gate's Titanic expeditions in 2021 and 2022. There were more abandoned or halted dives than completed ones, due to a range of problems, big and small. The communication system hardly functioned at all. Issues with batteries, electrical systems, sonar equipment, and navigation arose. There was even a thruster installed the wrong way, and ballast weights that wouldn't release properly. During one dive, Rush instructed the occupants of the Titan to rock the sub back and forth at great depths, attempting to dislodge the sewer pipes he used for negative buoyancy. They managed to reach the seafloor but struggled for hours to locate the wreck. It's puzzling how they couldn't locate a 50,000-ton ship. In one instance, a group was trapped inside the sub for 27 hours on the launch and recovery platform. Other mission specialists were sealed inside for up to five hours before the sub even launched, experiencing uncomfortable heat like a sauna. Arthur Lubel, a German businessman who dived in 2021, referred to the experience as a kamikaze operation when speaking to the Associated Press. To be fair, some individuals did get to witness the Titanic and live to tell the tale. However, many others were left disappointed after spending a considerable amount of money wearing their Ocean Gate branded clothing and performing tasks on an industrial ship. Ocean Gate's Titanic Expedition 2023 promotional video, which has since been taken down, depicted mission specialists cleaning the sub and its ballast pipes. Even when Rush offered consolation dives of 300 feet in the harbor, those were frequently canceled or halted. When news broke on June 18th that the Titan had gone missing, those familiar with deep sea exploration didn't believe that it had merely vanished, drifting unnoticed. The reason was that the Titan lacked an emergency beacon, so it seemed inconceivable that its location would remain unknown. No one thought that the passengers were slowly depleting their oxygen supply. Even if the sub was caught within the Titanic wreck, this wouldn't explain why its tracking and communication signals abruptly disappeared at a depth of 3,347 meters. The prevailing concern was the possibility of collapse, as Leahy expressed. The consistent worry was the potential failure of the pressure hull in that particular craft. However, the families of those on board were unaware, as was the public, and it would be heartbreaking not to hold on to some slim hope for survival, a remote possibility of a miracle. Yet, what was the more preferable outcome to hope for? That they met their end in an implosion at supersonic speeds? Or that they were still alive but faced extremely slim odds of being located, left to suffocate over four days in a sub that was as comfortable as an MRI machine? No amount of awareness of the tragedy could have prepared anyone for witnessing the sight of the Titan's inner components being lifted off the recovery vessel, Horizon Arctic.
Eight-inch thick titanium bonding rings bent, a tangle of cables, wreckage in disarray, twisted metal, torn exterior panels. It seemed as if they had been torn from Grendel's grasp in some mythic underwater battle. Yet, it wasn't some legendary conflict. It was just the result of calculations and forces. A cold calculation illustrating the impact of 6,000 psi pressure on an object unprepared for it. A person involved in the recovery operation mentioned that the the wreckage itself stood as evidence that no one aboard the sub had suffered. From the remaining fragments I observed, the destruction was swift and violent. The Abyss pays no attention to your education or lineage. Whether you went to Princeton or your ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence. When you venture into her domain, she dictates the terms. According to him, every piece he encountered had lost its original five-inch thickness, reduced to mere shards and fragments. The event was truly catastrophic. It was torn apart. Even now, after returning to land, he was still trying to process what he had witnessed. He reflected on how people often underestimate the sheer force of the ocean. Many think of the ocean as a place to relax at the beach, put their feet in the sand, and watch the waves roll in, he mused. They're completely unaware. It wasn't supposed to unfold this way. At the start, Ocean Gate's mission appeared promising. Founded in Everett, Washington in 2009, the company aimed to offer manned submersible services for reaching ocean depths that were previously inaccessible to most individuals and organizations. Yet, there's a significant gap between intention and execution, and parts of the Titan now rest at the bottom of that chasm. Following the tragedy, Ocean Gate fell silent, suspending its operations. Its website and social media accounts suddenly vanished. Its promotional videos were removed. Emails sent to the company received this response. We appreciate your inquiry. However, at this time, OceanGate is unable to provide further information. Phone calls were met with a disconnection notice. Prior to the Titan's final descent, there hadn't been a fatal accident in a human-occupied submersible for nearly five decades, despite a 2,000% increase in the annual number of dives during that period. In the 93-year history of manned deep-sea exploration, no submersible had ever suffered an implosion. Ultimately, it's not just about technology, but the meticulous and nerdy engineering that ensures predictability. Submersibles had earned their reputation as the least risky mode of transport in the world, even though they operated in the most perilous environment. However, there's one cardinal rule every deep-sea explorer understands. The objective isn't merely to dive. The true goal is to dive and return safely. And now, it's time for the giveaway. We're offering this poster, which will ship to you anywhere around the globe. To participate, leave a comment below. Once you've commented, ensure you're subscribed to our channel and have notifications enabled so you won't miss any future giveaways or videos from us. If you enjoyed this video, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with friends. We'll randomly choose a winner and announce them in the comment section of our next video. So stay tuned. Should you be the fortunate winner, we'll contact you directly to arrange shipping. Good luck to all, and we're excited to read your comments. From all of us here, thank you for watching, and as always, keep the enthusiasm alive. Until the next video, take care, and see you soon.